I just walked my dad uh, to the immigration office when I was five and legally changed my name to Tony after Tony Danza. That's one of the cool things I've heard. That's <laughs> <pretty sweet. laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Noah Lichtenstein from Crossover VC. In this series, we bring together leaders of the world's top startups and athletes and entertainers at the top of their fields to talk about what drives them, what they can learn from each other, and what the future holds. Today we got a special Stanford alumni edition of The Crossover, and we're going to talk about the on-demand economy and food delivery. And I'm excited to be teaming up with Christian McCaffrey of the NFL's Carolina Panthers and Solomon Thomas of the 49ers. Christian and Solomon were best friends and roommates while at Stanford, and both were top 10 selections in the 2017 NFL Draft. And today we're catching up with Tony Hsu, the co-founder and CEO of DoorDash, the leading food delivery platform in the United States, with over 300,000 restaurants on its platform, more than $2.5 billion in venture capital funding, and a valuation of $16 billion. So we've got some amazing guests today, and Tony, Christian, Solly, thank you guys so much for taking the time. Appreciate you having me. It's exciting. Thank you so much. First off, before we get into anything, Tony, congratulations on the new addition to the family. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's why I got my cup of coffee right here, you know? So, <laughs> and you named him Christian, right? That's, that's what I heard. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you to Tony. You, I mean, and I can speak for Solly, but you, my college experience was was very good because of DoorDash. And my NFL experience has been great because of DoorDash. So thank you. I, I so. can't tell you how many times I've literally been on a treatment table, table eating something from DoorDash. <laughs> I hear you, man. I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah. that. So Tony, we all know DoorDash as, you know, the huge success that it is today. But you just give us a you know, quick rundown of what is DoorDash and what was the genesis of the original idea? I, I think DoorDash today is um, maybe better known as America's largest food delivery um, app um, in which you can get, you know, 300,000 restaurants delivered to you, you know, in 30 minutes or less. But it really never started that way. And, and it was, it was never, it's a bit I ironic that we became America's largest delivery platform, even though that was never the goal. The goal was really to help, um, you know, people like my mom, um, who are local business owners. And um, I, I mentioned earlier that I was an immigrant who came to this country. Uh, one common way that many immigrants kind of make it is, um, they work odds and ends jobs um, to put food on the table. One of them was at a restaurant where I was, I guess, lucky enough to be a dishwasher for, for pretty much the better um, part of my childhood. And so um, the goal was really to help people like her and really make their businesses successful. And so while my co-founders and I were at Stanford, we talked to you know businesses in the area, in the, in the you know, San Francisco Bay Area, and Delivery wasn't actually the first idea because the ultimate question that we realized we needed to answer was how do you help people do business in a world where customers aren't walking inside their stores for every purchase? And so the first place we decided to start was delivery. And um, that's actually what kicked off at our apartment really off of Stanford. And, um, and that's how we got started seven years ago. And now $2.5 billion in venture capital funding later and a nice $16 billion reported price tag these days. Uh, you ever just sit back and say, wow, it's crazy. Looking back to like sitting in those dorms or sitting off campus and just how you got here. I mean, I had like at least 60 rejections, right, for our first initial investment into DoorDash. At least, I mean, I just stopped counting at some point because it's, I mean, who cares? Um, and, and, and you don't want to get, you know, that depressed. You know, sometimes my co-founders and I joke about it because we used to have bets on, you know, how many deliveries per day we thought we could do. And if we could even hit 50 orders a day, and my co-founders and I, you know, did all of the deliveries the first couple of years ourselves. And actually, we still have a practice of every person in the company doing deliveries once a month. I'm not exactly sure you can always plan it um, when you're sitting in a 1,000 square feet apartment for 20 people. Um, but uh, it, it, a, a lot of uh, luck has bounced our way. During these last six months, um, what are you like hearing from small businesses right now and like kind of like what they're going through and like how they're able to still operate? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the pandemic has been the most difficult thing for local businesses um, in three decades. And so in this new world, um, it's trying to think through, okay, well, seriously, how are we going to do business um, when we're used to having at least 80% of our business um, just turning tables and the people that were coming inside. For example, yes, we can drive them a lot of business, but we think that actually 
the way for them to get out of this is for them to do their own e-commerce. And so all of those things that effectively we've we're doing for ourselves, we're giving away also as products so that these stores can do on their own. And that's probably the biggest way in which we're helping. But I think the longer term things is you want to make sure that people can help themselves. And I think, you know, our business has always been about making sure that they're successful. One of the things that um, I think was a trend already before COVID was this shift toward kind of off-premise dining, right? If you look at most of these restaurants, a lot of them, over half their customers are actually never setting foot in their restaurant. And so yeah. I think one of the interesting things that I've seen from the investment side is that it's been an acceleration of this shift from restaurants being designed for nice physical spaces and high you know, foot trafficked areas to how can we actually leverage platforms like DoorDash to facilitate all these off-premise orders? I think you know the future, whether it's food or whether the future is retail, they, they kind of share, in my opinion, a, um, a, a similar challenge they have to they have to overcome. And, and to me, this is the biggest challenge in, in business in terms of what will move the economy because the businesses on the streets produce sixty percent of the GDP. So, in, to us, we kind of see a world where. We're going to have showrooms where you're going to want to go in, touch and feel, um, and that might be better for certain types of categories or um, items for purchase. And then there's, uh, you know, other types of things you want to buy, like where you just want to consume it wherever you are. And I think that's what we're, ha that's kind of the struggle that everyone's going through. And I think these businesses who've been used to, you know, just having everybody walk inside their stores are now feeling like, wow, the, the world was moving under my, my feet. Now it's really moving under my feet. And how do I learn almost a new language, a new skill? Hey, Christian, let me ask a question. So um, your dad, your dad was a big time, you know, NFL star, and you got a good, you know, good exposure to the NFL lifestyle as a kid. Um, how have you seen kind of the shift in what the locker rooms and, you know, the opportunities available to NFL players back then versus what, you know, what you and Solly get to see now in today's world where with social media, with technology, your brands are just you know so much more powerful than than your dad's generation. Yeah, it's a good question. I think you know when you when you look at uh, the marketability of players now, and there's so much that that you can do off the field and benefit you know what you would call your brand. And uh, the beauty of it is you can choose you know how much you want to do, how much you don't want to do. Um, but also, I think I think when you look at the sport in and of itself and the technology uh, that that enhance not just you know, performance on the field, but recovery off the field, it's its completely game changing. You know, you're never done learning. I do have a question that when something happens, like adversity strikes, what's the process that you go through to to figure out what the next step is? Because that's something we have to do all the time, right? You, yeah. I, you know, first play of the game, I yeah. just got smacked in the ankle. Okay, how do I adapt so that I can get through this game? And, and not just get through it, but excel. You want to coach people and grade people on the inputs, not the outcomes. You know, like I'm not going to focus on what the score of the game is. I'm going to focus on, you know, did you run the right route? You said you were going to run seven yards, turn left. Y yes or no, did you do that? And, um, and I think as, you know, my job as the coach, if you will, is to make sure that, you know, I'm having you run the right routes in the first place right. and that if you do execute it, you know, at the end of the day, the players have to make the play. For example, let's take the pandemic you talked about, right? So we saw some of it happening or going on in places like China, obviously, um, in the January, February kind of time frame. And so very quickly, it was, you know, putting together a 10 week plan. The first priority is make sure that we would work with governments to keep all the businesses running. And then step two, was making sure that we can support merchants, making sure that we can support the safety of drivers. So, you know, getting a, you know, we started buying, for example, masks, hand sanitizers, gloves, like tens of, you know, like tens of millions of units of these in the January, February timeframe, um, just because we know that if this hits, it's really gonna hit very fast and very hard. Um, and, and so making sure businesses were open, making sure that there were, that everyone could be safe. We defaulted everything to no contact and we used to drop off at the door. And and so like, it was just building a plan. Like I'm sure like you and Solly probably every single game probably and, and probably even every single practice have, have things you all wanna work on. And it's really no different. You know, for our story was we were never the first company in any market 
Um, and, and so we had to come from behind, so to speak, in every single market. Because I don't think you just show up one day and then you start quote unquote winning. And the pandemic was really no different. But that's the process, though. I, I, I was curious, like one of the things y'all, you, you, you know, for both of you, the question for both of you is the amount of opportunities that you have you, you, that presented to you, whether it's on the field or off the field, whether it's in you know, tech or whether it's in shoes, how do you like make sense of it all? And how do you like stay disciplined about maybe making sure you do what's important? Yeah, I mean, I would say you really have to do your own research. I mean, it's fun to like good people, I mean, who love what they do and know what they're talking about. Cause nowadays everyone can just go on like Instagram and say they know right. what they're doing, say, they, say they're helping people, but you want to find the right people who can help you. But like, I, I was talking to Christian a little, a, lot, a little bit ago and I was like, I feel like the more I learn, you know, mm -hmm the more I realize it's not real. Um, but it definitely is a lie and, and, and it, it can be stressful at times, but if you're disciplined and you love what you're doing, um, it definitely pays off. To Sally's point, you know, I think everything I'm sure it's the same with you is about balance. And I think the, the best thing that I've learned is when to say no and, and find people who are, who are smart and conservative when it comes to spending your time and your money wisely and uh, who, are, who aren't going to lead you astray. Because I always approach, you know, training and my family first and, yeah. and always keep those first, you know, because I, I have a job to do. At the end of the day, you know, all these appearances and this and that, these business deals, they don't come unless I succeed on the field. And I'm aware of that. But the moment that you start to take yourself out of your happiness realm, and I think the moment you, mm. you're doing something that's not making you happy, is the moment you say no, no matter how much money it's worth, no matter how much uh, you know fame you're gonna get. It's all about the team you put around you. You know, um, there are more opportunities for guys like Christian and, and, and Solomon now than than you know prior generations. And we're talking tech here because tech really is, as you and, and I know, Tony, it's the engine of the new economy. It's where all the money's being made. made. It's where all the new companies are. It's different between you know getting paid to wear a shoe or show up in an ad. Yeah versus actually getting equity where you're now an owner of those companies. So what I always say to the guys that I work with who, who are still playing on the field or on the court is, you know, your star is never gonna shine brighter than it does right now. So to Christian's point, you focus on being the best darn football player you can, you spend your time with your family and stuff that matters. And what I think where the team helps is you focus on being the best that you can be I'm going to be over here creating these opportunities, filtering opportunities, surfacing stuff for you so that when you do have, you know, that limited amount of time to put headspace toward it, you know, you have somebody you're working with. So I think a lot of today's athletes are building great teams around themselves based on what they're looking to, to help unlock more of those opportunities that weren't around for prior generations. I think that's a good point too, is, is investing time into stuff that you're excited about as well and mm -hmm. stuff that you know, is gonna last you a long time. And put that energy and that investment into meeting guys like you guys, you know, and and, and making connections and continuing relationships. And, you know, when you, like you said, when you put yourself around the right team and the right people, those opportunities are gonna be there down the road. So I, th I think that's important. I thought, I thought that was a good point. How did you suss out like who was real and, it, and who were people you wanted to be around versus, I don't know, who just wanted to be along for the ride? Kind of just like from going back to my decision to go to Stanford, you know, it was about um, challenging myself and growing myself. I want, to, I want to be around people who are going to make me grow and be the best me. People who are going to make me happy, who are going to challenge me and uh, just make me better. The most powerful thing I learned is that when you're when you're good with yourself and you're solid with yourself, uh, anything ever, anyone after that is kind of a bonus. It, it sounds harsh and, and sometimes it. It's, it's kind of a cruel way to live and, and there, once again, it's balanced to this, but if you're not, you know, in, in the same wavelength as I am, you know, it's no hard feelings, but we, we're not going to be friends. And then when it comes to your team, it's, it's, it's no different. It's guys who, who want to succeed. They want you to succeed and they're very business oriented and professional and are good people. How, how often do you use DoorDash yourself? Uh, I'm about once a day. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, I, I use it for, yeah. <laughs> There's been so amazing, but before I let you go, we wrap up every episode with a quick rapid fire. First question, what's your go-to restaurant for delivery? For food. Roots. Little Star Pizza. Oh, that's good. What's your favorite memory from your time at Stanford? Probably winning the Rose Bowl. You know, obviously winning it was a lot of fun, but the, the, the guys that we did it with was, 
special. I mean, that was one of the, one of the best experiences in my life. Just probably time in the locker room with the guys. I mean, it's the best locker room in the world. Yeah, I, I think for me, besides like you know starting DoorDash and schlepping around hummus in my Honda, <laughs> it is the people you meet, and 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 hopefully you know for some of them, it's it's the lifelong relationships you build later on. All right. So, what's your quarantine cheat food? So we had these maple scones that uh, my my girlfriend and my mom and and her and her sister would make. Here I am trying to be really healthy. <laughs> I think, uh, I think your Madden score just started doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I had to get out of there quick. Probably cinnamon rolls. I made some homemade cinnamon rolls that were fire. I like that. I like that. Donuts. What's one thing about each of you guys that somebody who didn't know you would be surprised to learn? I came up with my own name. One of the shows I used to obsess over was Who's the Boss, starting Tony Danza. And when I was five and I came to the States, nobody could pronounce my Chinese name. I just walked my dad uh, to the immigration office when I was five and legally changed my name to Tony after Tony Danza. That's one of the coolest things I've heard. That's really sweet. <laughs> so, so there you go. I play the piano, and that's kind of huh. one of my hobbies. Growing up, I was a big, uh, big theater geek, and one of the reasons I chose CAA as my agency was because I thought it'll be, if it ever presented itself, it'll be an easy transition into um, uh, film. Wow! All right, guys, last question. So, what's the one thing you haven't been able to do during quarantine that, as soon as it's over, it's the first thing you want to do? So, our roommates and suites, we we've been trying to plan like a trip for all of us for a couple of years now and um just next off season when we're all out of this we're gonna have one 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 heck of a trip together so <laughs> yeah i was that's exactly what i was gonna say and we you know like you said we talked about it for two years and the hype for it was getting to the point where i was like ready to get on a plane <laughs> now and roll so doordash actually has offices in all of our major markets so we have over 16 offices um, and we haven't seen each other except on, you know, virtually. Wow. And, and so just, just even seeing teammates where a lot of the energy feeds off of one another, that'd be pretty cool too. Guys, uh, this, is, this has been amazing. Again, just really appreciate you guys and wish you guys the best of luck. Thank you so much. Likewise. Good. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. Thanks again for stopping by the crossover. You can give our guests a follow here and here and check back with us soon for more Founder Stories. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.